So I'm speaking with uh, now. You have to make tell me if I get the pronunciation of your name correct or incorrect. But um, the way I say it, Miguel Angel Cano Santizo. Am I correct or am I close? You are close. Let's say. <laughs> okay. It's, it's Miguel Angel, but uh, more or less. Uh, no problem. Thank you very much. Then um, now, Miguel. The reason that we are talking, I discovered your work through the Greek rock revolution documentary that you did a few years ago. And we'll talk about that, but we'll also talk about some of the other things that uh, you have done as well. And you've done a lot. So let's see what we can uh, touch on. But before we start talking about everything that you have done, Tell us your introduction. Give us your introduction about how you became a filmmaker and how you got into making movies because uh, you sent me the your TED talk and I discovered that that wasn't always what you wanted to do, was it? No, no not at all. I, I actually, I studied computer engineering because I wanted to become air traffic controller. That was my dream. And uh, But there, there was not a call for exam. So... I started to travel. Meanwhile, waiting for the for the call for the call for the exam to to come, and eventually ended up in Peru, where I had a, an opportunity to start making my my first two documentary movies, just because I I didn't know what to do. Like that was uh, to make it short. And um, when I made these two documentaries, I I saw that I had the chance of making a, a change through making movies through telling stories, and I thought that was a, like a superpower. You know, when you are 20 years old and you dream of changing the world, and suddenly you know, you make a movie and people can reflect about it. That uh, was something really powerful. Then eventually the, the call for the exam for the traffic controller came. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that uh, is very well paid. You don't work so many hours. It's uh, really like a, a good fit. Uh, you know, uh, as I say in the, in the TED talk, like every mother wants for her, her son <laughs> to become a traffic controller, you know. And uh, I, because obviously I study uh, computer engineering. Uh, you know, it was an investment from my parents, from, my, from myself, of time. So when the, when the exam came, I, I prepared myself and I eventually passed it. You know, there, there were thousand people applying for it. It was really tough. But then the moment I passed it, I was already, my dream was a different one. I, I had a, I had a favor, uh, you know, I had tasted the flavor of uh, making change, making movies, traveling, and uh, that, was, uh, that was too sweet for me. So um, I ended up going to Indonesia and I had another opportunity to make more, more documentary movies. And that's where everything started. Very nice. And yeah, you have made quite a few movies as well, but uh, you've called your, your company Mr. Challenge Films because you enjoy the challenges and finding solutions. What has been the biggest challenge that you faced when making some of your movies? You know, to me, because I, I, I honestly, I, I don't believe, and that's, what, that's something when I was working on my TED Talk, I really tried hard not to tell people what to do. You know, I, I always uh, talk from my perspective because I think there are as many ways to be happy and successful as people on the planet. And I think that should be clear from point one. I, I talk about my opinion. And in my case, I need challenges. It's the way for me, you know, to wake up with, a, with strength, to wake up with a motivation. To, and if a challenge is not working anymore, then I need another challenge. You know, and, and sometimes you have different challenges in parallel and it's for me it's a way to keep learning. That's the most important. To keep the, you know, like a, I, I feel myself as, as a kid because when I look at kids, I see that they are excited about everything. And I look at them and I, I think I want to be like them. I want to be excited because then you are, a, you are on the subway and you see adults and you, they are not excited at all going in the subway to work or going. And I'm like, I look at kids and I say, I want to be like them, not, not like adults. So my way to, to be, to, to stay, to remain this, uh, this innocence are challenges. And I had a, quite a few <laughs> interesting ones. I, I believe the, the, the most hardcore one was after Indonesia. I went to Tibet and I spent one month there uh, trying to, to show what the Chinese government is doing to the Tibetan culture. So I was literally running away from the Chinese uh, police uh, and, until they finally arrested me and sent me back. And that was a uh, very hardcore, but uh, it was totally worth it. So. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that uh, that uh, documentary that you did. It was absolutely fascinating, uh, and we'll touch on that as well. 
but yeah, you've traveled to many, many places. You've traveled to Papua New Guinea, Nepal, Israel, Greece, to name just a few places. Out of all the places that you've visited, I mean, obviously, I've done some traveling myself and I enjoy every place that I go to. But has there been any standout moments or any standout places that you ever thought to yourself, hmm, I really like this. I can maybe even move here, live here. Um, yeah, I, uh, this is a question I, I got asked um, many times. Um, because I, In total, I, I, the funny things that I never traveled until I was 21 or something, you know, but then I started and it was uh, very much, and now I travel over 80 countries in 10 years. And uh, for me, the, the so when people ask this, everybody's expecting like an exotic country or, but to me, my number one country is Greece. Well, wow. for, for many reasons, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in Europe, we find it as a, it's the cradle of civilization, of philosophy. And people there, they, they really consider conversation as something really important. So they take care of it. You know, if, uh, if their children don't pass the exam in the school, it's okay. But if their children cannot have a good conversation, then they are worried. You know what I mean? It's their priority to, to be able to hold the conversation, to listen, listen to each other, to keep the tolerance level to high standards. And I love it there, you know, and then you put on the conversation, great Greek cuisine with a great, a great weather and the beach. And it's just a fascinating culture for me in every possible sense. And you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can breathe the, the arts and culture. So many people there are, are devoted to arts and culture. And I think it's, a, it's amazing. And also when they believe in something, they fight for it. And this is something I envy for the, my position from my country, which is Spain, sometimes I'm, I'm envious because they, we observe how our society changes. They don't observe. They, they take action and they try to, to make changes. Okay, so you don't see the same thing happening in Spain? No, no, not very much. Not very much. Now I'm coming from Holland and actually the, the, I was uh, shooting a documentary for the main German TV, which is Deutsche Welle. And to me, you know, we, it was shooting a documentary about how they, they are reclaiming the streets. This is a, it's a, to me, it's a fascinating sub subject because uh, cities uh, is, a, is a, probably the most complex uh, thing uh, humans came up with. Cities are very complex. Uh, many things happen there and it, it kind of works. Uh, it's arguably well or wrong, but it works. And uh, until 100 years ago, cities were 100% made for people because the, they were the inhabitants. Then the car comes into the cities and it changed everything. And now the traffic engineers, they have so much power on the cities that they are totally made for cars. And then humans, we try to, to do our thing in the city, but we, you know, we, we have to, to live with the pollution, with the noise, with the... So just for your question, in Holland, they are reclaiming their cities. And I just come from uh, Amsterdam, from Groningen, and uh, you can hear the people chatting you know, in the street because there is no noise, there are no cars. They said, we don't want cars anymore. And they started by painting the, the street themselves, putting uh, obstacles for the cars, saying, these are our streets, we want them. So when I see things like this happening in the world, I, I, first I try to give the voice so I can, it can maybe inspire others to do the same because I, I believe, you know, if we want change, many people claim to the government or writing on Facebook, no, the change has to come from us. That's for me is uh, out of question. Yeah, absolutely. Change comes from getting off your seat, getting off the couch and doing things, not posting on social media. Or complaining. The complaining is the, definitely not very constructive. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you in that regards. And I've been to Switzerland as well, where from what I understand, from what you tell me, they do a similar thing to what happens in uh, Holland. Totally. Yeah, it's a very advanced society as well. Um, so you said you've been to over 80 countries. Is there any countries that you have not been to where you want to go to? Yeah, the thing is, uh, I have a, a black spot yet in my, in my travel list, which is Africa. I haven't been to Africa at all because it's a place that I find so fascinating that you, in, in my opinion, you, you can't go one or two weeks. That makes sense. So I, I never had the, the time to go properly, you know? So this is my is what I have envisioned for the next year. Next year is an Africa year for sure. I already have a project in Cameroon for in January. I cooperate a lot with uh, clowns, 
because I, I, I find it fascinating also how, to me, uh, have the superpower of making people smile, I, I think is uh, amazing. And I try to support them with my work uh, so they can then, you know, with the movies, they can get support. With the photographs, they can make calendars to get more funding. So, you know, they can make their, their work look more professional so they can get more funding. So this is something I do every year artistically. And I, but you, it is kind of thing that you get way more than, you know, you receive way more than you give because it's, a, it's incredible. You know, I, I, I cooperated in many humanitarian projects and in all of them, you just hope you are making a change. You are putting all you have and maybe, but when you work with clowns, you see the effect immediately. Uh, I went um, after the, the super devastating earthquakes in Nepal. We went right afterward there to the to the most devastated areas from the earthquake, and um, you could see that the the children they had no motivation. You know their their morale was totally down. And we arrived to these places, and first it was really tough, but after two three days acting there, you could see a change. You could see people smiling, playing again the kids, and I think this is a totally magic. So for me, I'm uh, totally appreciate uh, what clowns can do. Fantastic. Um, now, your documentary, you, uh, we mentioned one of the places that you've been to and uh, was Israel. And your documentary, Hebron Narrative Warfare, you tried to get some clarity around about uh, the Israel and the Palestine conflict. I have to be honest and, and say I don't know exactly what is happening and I don't know the full story there, but it's it's a very complicated issue. So when you went there, did you learn anything and uh, that you didn't know beforehand? And what was it like for you going there and trying to make this documentary? It was a really intense experience in many levels. First of all, uh, to me, I, I really take my, you know, the, the chance of, of telling the stories and making movies for me is a huge responsibility because people are going to watch it and are going to probably believe it if the work is good. So, you know, I, I think this is a, something really massive that you have to take seriously. So if I talk about something, I want to, be, to become really a, an expert before that, at least as much as I can. Try to speak with people, try to read the history, try to, but with the, with the Israel-Palestine conflict, before going there, I tried to watch as many documentaries as I could to prepare myself. And I found, again, I'm talking about my opinion, that none of them was uh, valid because they were either from one side, from the other side. They were propaganda. They could be good documentaries, but they were propaganda. So then for me, a documentary, by definition, cannot be propaganda. It should be informative. For me, the way to, uh, nowadays, uh, this uh, Netflix way up and all this, to, it's very easy filmmaking. They, 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 they tell you what you have to think. They put it out there, and this is, okay, this is, where, this is the conflict, this is what happened, and this is what you have to think. For me, this is taking the, the audience as, a, as not intelligent. So I wanted to do some, something different in Israel Palestine. I wanted to, to give a voice. First, go and understand it. I went there and I, I stayed in Hebron because this is another thing. It's so big, the conflict, that if you want to tackle it fully, uh, it doesn't make sense. It cannot be a good work because it's too big of a conflict. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to tackle something specific, which is Hebron, because it's the most representative. It's where the Cave of Abraham was there and it's the where 1,000 settlers are living and there are 2,000 soldiers. There is a wall dividing the city. So I said, you can really feel it, but it's just Hebron. My movie is not about the conflict, it's about the whole conflict, it's about Hebron. So first I live a month there. Uh, every day I was talking with shopkeepers and the first two weeks, my camera was uh, in the, the room, I didn't use it. It was just to, to feel the, the vibe, to speak with people. I was in a fire with the main activists at night at the 3 a.m. The, around the fire with the main activists of the Palestine. The day after, I was in the morning in a synagogue. Uh, they are every day for during two weeks uh, until finally they could, uh, you know, the Jews living there because they they feel th threatened every day. So they are really um, most of media that go there, you know, they also so they don't trust anyone. But so I, I went there two weeks, and finally they speak to me, and then you 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 establish a relation, and then they open to you, and then it's time when you can start filming because you understand a little bit the situation. So it was a really, and what you say about learning, it was a, for me it was massive also because I always try as much as I can to, to stay neutral. And to me, 
if you could, if you ask, if you ask me for a superpower, I wouldn't choose a flying or a, I would choose to be neutral because then I think I could be a great documentary filmmaker. I right? try as much as I can, but we are humans, and you always have some some bias. And I went to Israel, Palestine, honestly, with my bias. But then when you are there, trying to stay neutral, uh, I, I I grew an empathy for both parts, and I. You know, I understand that m most of them are people that want to be in peace and want to live and want to stay up to their values. Of course, obviously, their values are different to my values, but uh, but I respect that people, you know. So, and and again, the, my what I took from there is that uh, again, is everything comes from above. You know, there are some people above that play with the real people, and then the real people are suffering the what you know the games, the power games. But the people down there, to me, the, at least my experience, and I went, uh, so again, that just to finish the story, I, I was editing the documentary and I wanted, so I made it in a way that, the, for example, the Palestinian says something about the Israeli, and then I go ask the Israeli, okay, this is what they say, what do you have to say? Then this. Uh, so the whole documentary goes like that. So every, every, every claim has a response from the other side, a every single one. So then I, I'm not saying anything. I'm, you are hearing, a conversation from them, which is an impossible conversation because it would never happen by itself, you know? So I was like a messenger because I made, my, my merit there was that I both sides trusted me, which is not easy. So after eight months, I had a few answers, which are which few claims which were not answered. So then I went again another month. So to, to have answers to a specific questions, so I made sure 100% of the claims are answered. So to me, I, I'm, didn't get too much, uh, and this is another learning one more time, didn't get too much exposure this documentary. It went to a festival and it won it. Just one. But then what happened? That everybody is expecting a side, you know? If you are pro-Palestinian, it, it disappoints you. If you are pro-Israeli, it disappoints you. And everybody has a side. So, but then I, I think, okay, it, it, uh, maybe it's good because uh, nobody who has a, uh, who is radical likes it. This is definitely a good thing. I agree with you in that regards. And I also think you made a good point about documentaries. They're telling you essentially what you should be thinking. Very few documentaries are neutral these days. And I think sometimes a lot of people forget with documentaries, the big name documentaries that are made and that you see on Netflix and those kinds of things, they're entertainment. They're made yeah. to entertain people. So I think the primary f thing on documentaries that we see these days is to always remember when you're watching it, this is made primarily for entertainment, really. Yeah. The, the, the thing is that we, we've become a, a fast society. People, people want things and they want, they want it now. I mean, I, I see it in my movies. There is a, the people that click it and they have the conversion is what people stay watching your movie. And uh, people, if they, they don't like the first minute, they will go. So, and people that do Netflix and all this, they, they know this. And the point with a good documentary is that you really want to understand and make your opinion. You need some time to observe, to reflect, but people will not, uh, if after two minutes, they, they are not having already, uh, you know, in a, in, a side, in a fiction movie, the White, the White House hasn't, Blown in pieces, or you know, so it happened very fast. If you see the movies, like the fiction movies from the 40s, from the 50s, uh, the guy is here and there is a tree, and the guy is walking to the tree. And if it takes him three minutes in the movie, it will be three minutes. And to me, this is fascinating because then you put yourself on the character and you are, oh, what is he thinking while going to that tree while walking? Oh, now he's uh, walking faster. No, no, he's stopping. And now, you will see the man, the tree, and a second later, he will be on the tree. And then there will be a voiceover telling you, hey, when I was walking to the tree, I understood that my father was the most important person of my life. Bang. But to me, this you know, it's so easy. Then the other three minutes, after three minutes, you will understand that he's there, maybe reflecting on his father, but you will not be so sure. And this is beautiful. Then you talk with five friends on the table and you discuss, what do you think this guy that was walking to the tree was thinking about? You know, back then, and I, I, I that, that's how my, my love to, to cinema started because I, like, like in the movie itself, I had the teacher who was amazing 
and he, you know, he woke up the, the love for uh, cinema in me. And then we would go and talk about movies and we all had different interpretations. And nowadays with nowadays movies, this is difficult because they are giving it to you, it's a sandwich. Yeah, yeah. I think, like you say, uh, everything these days is ha has to be fast paced, has to be Hollywood style superheroes. You, uh, the age of the kind of art house movie, it's yeah, almost dead. Yeah, you know the, the thing. I, I is a when when it's dead, it's like with music. You know, when it's dead, is when the underground scene can be the best. You know what I mean? So, so I believe, I, I know there are amazing filmmakers out there, but probably the best filmmakers are those who manage to don't care about the, you know, the mainstream. And they sacrifice uh, not being in Hollywood, not having a big production, but they do what they want. And some of them, they make a five hour movie. And they don't care if you're going to watch it or not. They do it because that's what they think they should be doing. And there is a lot of this also. There is a lot of music now. We, are, we live on the most mainstream era of music, but there are many people doing 20 minute songs. You know what I mean? The more, the more mainstream, the better the underground scene. So, so I believe there is a lot of amazing things happening in filmmaking nowadays. And uh, it's just probably not in Netflix, unfortunately. <laughs> very well said, very well said. I like that. So, I mean, for myself, I'm primarily a music fan. So I'm, I know where to search for underground music, but I don't know where to search for underground movies. So, you know, other you've got uh, quite a few of your documentaries on Vimeo. What other sites are, are, is there for people to try and track down? Yeah, underground filmmakers, non-mainstream things. Well, there there are some uh, festivals that they run online. There, especially with with COVID, this is something that has increased a lot. And you write uh, online film festival and. You know, maybe you pay five euro or something, and you can watch many movies, and you are contributing uh, to to independent filmmakers and to independent film festivals, which I think is important because then you are supporting it also. And, and in these uh, in these film festivals, you can access uh, really interesting stuff. And uh, obviously, the the odds is that maybe half the movies will be very awkward, weird. You know, uh, maybe twenty minutes, uh, nothing happening. But this is a you know, it's art. It's a uh, art house movies. Um, so yes, you mentioned that you went to Nepal and you had yeah a bit of a hard time while you were there. Yeah, you got arrested by the Chinese police almost immediately when you arrived in Nepal. So, how much research did you do before going there, and did you know what to expect? Could you have um, ever predicted that you know it was going to be as um, as difficult as it was for you to make your Nepal doc documentary. Yeah, sorry, just to correct, it was Tibet. Oh, sorry, my I, mistake. I, 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 no, no, it's not a mistake because there is a, a Tibet area which is in Nepal uh, and in India. But the, so I've made a lot of research before this because it's really hard. Uh, so when I was uh, presenting the movie in film festivals, I always start with the question to the audience: How big do you think Tibet? was for example if i was in germany i would say you think it was like berlin like bavaria or like germany and most people would say like bavaria which is a small region and then i would i would reply okay the, what today is the tibetan autonomous region is nearly three times the size of germany and that was just one out of the three historical tibetan regions so this is a very first important thing to understand the tibetan issue tibet itself was even bigger than the inland China back in the days. So, so it's really, you know, for China, Tibet is a really, again, it's a candy, you know? They have a water, they have sand, they have resources. They is the, the highest peak in the world, in the middle of Asia, between Russia, India, strategical point is incredible. So it's a really, it's not just uh, the few monks in the mountains, it's way more than that. It's a, one of the most strategic points in the world. So I, you have to research a lot. and. When I wanted to, to go to Tibet, because it starts with a, with a promise I made to a, I met a woman in Nepal, and um, well, it's a, I will make it very short, but I, I, I came from, from shooting in the morning, uh, the whole night I was climbing, then I, I, I had no money, I, I was very injured, and the woman came to sell me a necklace, and I was like, 
I wish that I could, but I, I'm totally broken, destroyed. And the woman then told me, look, all my necklaces are not from Tibet because I, I'm not living there since 25 years ago. But I have this one, which is a, I still keep from Tibet, and this is for you. And then she told me her story that she, she had to, to, fl to flee uh, Tibet and her, she hasn't seen her children ever since 25 years ago. And then I promised to her I would go to Tibet to make a movie. So that's how, how it started. And it started my research there. So I, I realized there were three historical Tibetan regions and the current Tibetan autonomous region uh, in truth is not autonomous. You, if you visit there, you will have a Chinese agent next to you all the time. You will have to sleep what they tell you, eat what they tell you. So for a filmmaker, as you can imagine, it's not the more exciting place. So then I thought, okay, I'm not going there. Where else can I go? Okay, there is this region, which was Tibet until very, very short ago, but everywhere you read is China. So I'm sure there must be some Tibet remaining there. And I, I researched as, as much as I could, but you can't research so much. So I researched from, from people on the exi in the exile. I interviewed them all, I, but uh, they don't even know what's happening there because it changed very fast. So then I went there and I was, I mean, the first day, uh, I was three, I, I went there hitchhiking and walking because you cannot take public transport, it would be too obvious. So after three, four days, I arrived to the first Tibetan town and the many Tibetan, because they are not used to see a foreigner. And they surrounded me, they, they saw my, my hair in the, in the arm and they were like, oh, incredible. <laughs> and, uh, and then the Chinese police came, show up, a dozen of agents, they took me to a hotel and they told me, you go tomorrow, you cannot be here. So, but I decided to go on, I jumped out the window in the middle of the, the morning and I left and then it is when the adventure started. So that was the starting point. And it was like that. Uh, I never knew where I would sleep at night. I, I just knew I could not be on the main road because I was being searched for. So I had to stay. And uh, so that's the thing that the movie is one thing, but my journey was a very different one because also it's very hard because if I would put anyone that was helping me on the movie, I would compromise very seriously their, their safety. And that's something that, you know, is totally above uh, any move you could do, the, the safety of the person. So I had to, to decide how to approach the, the documentary. So then I decided to, to use my journey, my, my travel as a, what I was experiencing, what I was uh, facing, no? that there is a place that w is still Tibet, but uh, w if you call somebody, you are still young, it's positive because you are telling that you are young, but it, you are also implying the same sentence that you soon will not be young anymore when you say you are still young. So that's what, why I chose still Tibet because that was my feeling there. Oh, it's great, mm. this is still Tibet, but man, so fast, so fast they are changing it. And, and they, want to, they want to make it become a touristic spot. It was really hard to navigate also because they changed the name of the towns into Chinese names, but everybody there is Tibetan. So if you ask the Tibetans, they don't know what you are asking for because they have different names. It was really complicated. And also uh, I went there in the nearly winter because I, I think, okay, you can't go to Tibet in summer. It's not the real thing, you know? So during the day it was okay, but then when the sun goes down, within one hour, it would be minus 20 degrees. Wow. Which means when the sun is going down, I have uh, 40 minutes to find a place to, to sleep. <laughs> Otherwise I have a big trouble. So it was always a everyday adventure. To run away from the police, to, to find a place to sleep and to find the, you know, stuff to tell. But it, that was, I was discovering every day. Fascinating. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed that uh, documentary, I have to say. Um, and one of the things when I watched that uh, documentary uh, was the the ritual, one of the rituals they had or traditions or however you want to say the word of um, feeding their dead to vultures, which to me and, you know, when you say it to other people, it sounds crazy, but to them, it's just normal. It's just what they do. So have has there been any traditions or um yeah anything along those lines that you've seen in other cultures also that made you think really that they do that that you found fascinating or that you found strange oh yes <laughs> many and uh, actually i'm working now on a movie that i want to edit now in, uh, in christmas from the papua new guinea i i went to papua new guinea to uh, I do a, every every two years. I do I call it humanitarian filming expedition. So I go to a, a developing country. I go I get in touch with local NGOs, and I offer my my support as a 
as you know, as a producer. So I make movies, photography, I change the website. So I create a two, three minute movie with a, a dossier that they can use to ask for funds. I did it in Mongolia, in Peru, in Indonesia, and the last time was in Papua New Guinea. So I did it for five uh, very small NGOs. And one of them that I found when I was there, they told me, oh, you have to meet this woman, it's very interesting. I got there, and she's, her name is Rebecca. And in that area, they still burn witches. This is really incredible. I mean, witches, of course, because nobody's a witch. Yeah, but that's fine. Uh, that one of the cases that I interviewed there, uh, for example, two kids were playing in the, in the street, and it was very windy. So the, the branch of a tree broke, fell on, on one of the kids, and he died. A, a, tri a tribe leader was passing by, and was like, oh, look at this. OK, there is a house there. The woman living there must be a witch for this wow. to happen. Then the crowd goes there, take her, and put, put her on fire, and they introduce uh, iron burning into her intimate parts, you know, really, really hardcore thing. And then, but they don't want to kill her because they want her to be very, very uh, injured and, and to be rejected. And even if you are the father or anyone, you cannot get close to her because otherwise people will say you are supporting a, a witch. So you cannot do that. And nobody does it. But Rebecca does it. She's a woman, a black woman, super powerful with the dreadlocks, amazing. And she take all these uh, witches and you know to protect them at her house. Witches and their and their of course and their orphan uh, children. Yeah, the children. I say orphan orphan because the father disappeared. Yeah. So this woman is uh, incredible. It's incredible. And of course, when I if I make this movie, my, my point is not putting in value. My point is, uh, look what this crazy thing is happening. We have to do something about it. Because of That's... course, um, funny enough, always uh, happen to be the female, the witch, right? Yeah. I mean, you in Tibet, you got arrested uh, by the Ch the Chinese police. Uh, you, you've mentioned now, you know, the burning of the witches. Has there been any moments where you really felt unsafe yeah i think feel, feeling unsafe is kind of my natural status that's where i where i feel good because again it's with, with the with the challenge thing i you know when i take my camera i have a two states one is normal life and then when i go out and take my camera something happens you know when you take your when i put my camera in my hands i don't maybe minus 15 once for example in ukraine i had a, the perfect shot and i was but i was there take the photograph and then I realized that my hands nearly froze, like really. Then I was in Indonesia and I wanted to film a volcano. I went through jungle that was uh, full with pythons and I was sleeping there in the, you know, around the fire thinking, okay, anytime a, a five meter long python can come and eat me or I don't know, I, I, I cross, I cross Colombia hitchhiking. Uh, but you know, when I'm doing those things, I feel alive. When I'm in Berlin doing some business or whatever, I, I'm like, oh, this is not the real thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically what you're trying to say is that you're a little bit crazy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, at the very start, I mentioned that uh, I found out about uh, your movie making through the Greek rock revolution documentary that you did, which is the reason that we are speaking today. So. I mean, how familiar were you with the Greek rock music scene before you did the film? Oh, very much. I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm a stoner music. What they call they don't like to call it a stoner. We can call psychedelic rock. Uh, I was in love with this kind of music, and for that reason, I went. I moved in Berlin because in Berlin is a place where you can see this kind of concerts every every week, two or three times, uh, in a very small venues with the right next to the people, it's really amazing. So I, I, I decided, okay, I'm gonna move to Berlin a few months so I can really enjoy this because it's happening right now. So I had my, let's say, top 20, 25 bands that I really like. Uh, I have my favorite, uh, you know, list, playlist and everything. And one day I was like, okay, I'm gonna check just out of curiosity where my favorite bands are from because I didn't know most of them sing in English or they're instrumental. And then I realized, uh, <laughs> Half of the bands that were my favorites were Greek. And I was like, what is this? What's going on, man? Then I, I moved in, um, in Berlin and I started watching many, many, many concerts. And it was something I was hearing from the people always, you know, in a concert. People were like, hey, what's happening in Greece, you know? 
having a, a conversation with person, that, a random person about rock, they would all comment what's happening with psychedelic rock in Greece. Then I had lived in Greece 10 years uh, earlier. I did oh, okay. my Erasmus in a, like a, a student exchange in university. So I already was familiar with the culture. And I had friends there to start asking and to start inquiring. Then in Berlin, uh, late at night with a few beers on top, I met a, a Greek, which is a, mer a merchandise promoter in uh, Greece. And, you know, I had the, I, I don't know where it came from, but I told him, yeah, I, I want to make a documentary about the Greek rock scene, but I had never thought about it until that very moment that I was saying it, you know? So it was something like a, a Just no idea synergy. came into your head. Yeah, I, I, met, I met this guy and I, uh, he said, yeah, I work in this festival and this one. And I was like, okay, then my head, you know, connected. I told him and he said, I will help you. And the morning later I woke up and I said, why not? Why not? Uh, and so it was very funny. I think it's a, it's a very well uh, worth telling a story that there. You know, when I was a, um, a same student in Greece, I had my first girlfriend, my first love. We were three amazing years together. She's wonderful and they split. And after 10 years, she proposed the exchange student to meet there again. And uh, I said, okay, great idea, let's go. We, we set the date and uh, like uh, two months later, I mean, earlier people started to meet, three weeks er earlier, I, we didn't really know how many people would go. And like two weeks earlier, nobody would go. But I said, I said I will go, I will go, you know? Because that's one thing I learned in life. If you want to do something, you have to do it regardless what other people do. It's your decision, you do it. So then I, I booked my trip to, to Greece and then is when I met this guy. So I had already the, the tickets and in that month, each of the seven bands I wanted to interview had at least two or three concerts that month. So by going one month, I could film, I don't know how many concerts I filmed there or how many, it was insane. I was filming four concerts a week and all, all around Greece. So it was really, really intense. And I, I, if you are a rock lover, imagine it was an incredible month to, to be for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, the bands that you included, I mean, you, you got some of the biggest names in the uh, Greek rock music scene, Tuba, Night Stalker, Put a Volcano, 100 Mods, Naxitras. Um, yeah, when I was watching it, I was kind of thinking to myself, how did he manage to get, you know, all of these bands? But yeah, sounds like you, you, you went there at a good time and managed to catch them all in the space of one month, which is amazing. Yeah, it's many things. It's just, it was the time precise, but also the, to me, the, the right timing historically, because those bands were happening, but they were not massive yet. So it was a, a movement. So it was it was really really interesting and also it was hard because you know a, a Spanish guy who lives in Berlin contact you you are a big band and you are like yeah yeah whatever so at the beginning they were not really into it until I went there and they saw me working they saw me doing it they saw and what happened with the rock bands you know we don't take you serious but if you are putting this band in then I have to be in also you know what I mean yeah, yeah. so it was a one band with the other and then if I have three bands. I was writing there, okay, I'm going to make a documentary about Greek rock, and these three bands are in there. Are you sure you don't want to be here? And then, of course, they, they fell in. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's the other question to ask. I mean, when when you contact these bands, you know, when, when somebody from Spain is uh, sending these bands a message and going, I'm from Spain, I'm a movie maker, I want to make a documentary about the Greek music scene. What what reaction do you get? Did it, you know, did, did most of the people say, ah, oh, this person's talking rubbish or no, it's never going to happen? What was the reaction? The reaction was like not really caring. They, they, they thought it would be like a small project or something, most of them. What happened here is that there were six bands which are really established. And then there was Puta Volcano, which was more starting. And they have a manager, uh, Michalis, is on the movie, he's amazing. And, and he, he saw the opportunity, okay, I'm going to put my band with the big names. This is great. So he, he embraced my project from the beginning. And uh, so, something very funny happened that six of these seven bands were, were playing, performing on a, on a festival the first weekend. So my, my original idea was to film them all there. But that weekend was a total disaster. I, I hired um, two filmmakers and they screwed up. I, I tried to talk, to talk with the sound technicians and some of them didn't record the songs, the audio, when the film was good. 
I wanted to come out there with 12 music videos and I came out with two. So I said, okay, probably this project was not meant to happen. That's it. But then the manager, Futa Volcano, he was like, hey, just that day when I was about to drop it, he was like, okay, we are going to, to, to this island that we booked the tickets for you, you know, uh, you're coming with the rugby players that they are going to make, they're all so excited. And I was like, okay, I cannot let it down, you know, now. Yes. So then I went and then there was amazing. So, and at the end it was better for the project because in the end I filmed bands all over Greece. So it's also a travel around Greece and the scenarios are different, the crowds are different. So it became more interesting thanks to the, the drama. <laughs> cool. I, I mean, that's, that's another question I wanted to ask you. I mean, how how familiar were, were you with like concert filmmaking like filming bands playing live had you done that kind of thing before because i imagine also the sound of a large rock band is very different to making a documentary in tibet or you know papua totally. new guinea so it's a, it's a different concept 100 percent different concept the thing is that luckily luckily in my in my hometown mo most of my best friends are amazing musicians so they were always on top of me to 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 play when I was a, be a beginning a beginner filmmaker, it's very common to focus only on the visuals and don't pay so much attention to the sound. Yeah. So they were always on top of me, uh, trying to teach me, man, great movie, but really sound is so important. And uh, thanks to them, I learned it. And the funny thing is that uh, uh, some of my friends they have a, a band which is amazing, another del Coco, and they they were four years working on an album. When they finally put it up, they came to me and said, "Hey man, we need you. We have to do something." Massive, you know, we, are, we have the theater, it's gonna be full, we have to do something different, extraordinary, and you are the person. What can we do? It's okay, give me some time to think. And I came up with the idea of making a whole movie. I made 48 videos that it was a fiction. So what happened is that people went to a theater to, to see a concert, and then suddenly, you know, the curtain is open and there is a projection. People don't understand a thing. Then the band start playing, and they see there is a connection, but they still don't understand anything. The song finishes and they want to clap, but then there is video with a text. So you, you don't clap because you're going to hear what's happening. So then I started engaging and there were 10 songs with 48 videos that I was uh, with, um, with an amazing light artist also playing with the art, with the, with the lights, with the visuals. And uh, it was uh, nearly one hour, 48 videos where the, the videos were explaining each song, but all together was a movie that at the end has a very strong resolution. So it was a... Technically, it was obviously I made it ten years ago, but uh, the concept, conceptually, I think it was uh, incredible. It, I think it was uh, amazing. I, I actually tried to make it with other bands, I still haven't found it. But it's, it's a project I want to really take it with a with a serious band uh, that is on tour and really make something. Because many times when I go to, a, of course, I say it from my perspective of a visual artist, I go to many concerts and sometimes I feel it's a we are missing an opportunity to to enhance the, the, the experience with some visuals, you know, something. So, so yeah, that project made me learn a lot about the filming concerts and music combine, combining. And then I made a few music videos. And obviously before the, this Greek rock revolution documentary, obviously I studied a lot. I got the best equipment I could and- Awesome, fantastic. And yeah, you'll have to send me, I'm not sure if it's available to view anywhere, the uh, other video that you've mentioned for the Spanish band, but if you if it's available, please send me the link. I'd love to see it. I will, I will, I will do it, yes. All, uh, my, all, my, movie, all my movies are, are, are free to, to watch, by the way. I know, that I saw your Vimeo channel, uh, but I just realized just before we started talking that you've got a YouTube channel as well, which has got many other things um, on there as well. So what is your main, where, where is the main place that people can see your films? You know, that, that, that was always a, a, a problem. You know, I, I never care about distribution because I, I, I enjoy so much making movies that I, I invest uh, three, four, five, six months working on the movie. Once I do it, I was like, okay, the job is done. Next one. Um, just recently, that's why my YouTube channel, I didn't even pay attention to it. You know, since I started traveling, all my friends were telling me, oh, you should do a YouTube channel, you should uh, record yourself. But I, I, I never really cared about it. I wanted to make movies and that was it. Just uh, recently, I made the new website, which is, I think has very well sorted all, the, all my work and definitely my Vimeo channel as well. 
Um, and then I started also to, thanks to the advice of some filmmaker colleagues, to get some distributor who could distribute my work. And for example, Steel Tibet is now is being shown at the at the national TV station in the U.S. and it's also in Amazon Prime. Uh, of Revolution won over a dozen awards. So you know now I work for the main German TV. So it's important. I with the with the passing of the years, I understood how the process of art works. I think many many artists' uh, mistake is that we I say we because I, it was my mistake too. We focus only on production. In my case, I was very strong in pre-production also, which I believe is the most important part. Pre-production and production. But there is distribution, which is, a, without this, you can be the best artist in the world. If you are not out there. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I know exactly what you mean. But I guess um, being, it can be difficult to be everything. You know, it's difficult enough being the musician, making the music, recording the music, booking the uh the shows yeah uh, the distribution side of things is something that i guess not everybody has learned yet uh, uh, that's the tricky part is the the dangerous part of art is distribution because uh, i've heard for example uh, uh, the the, um, the the main narrator of the Greek revolution movie is from metal hammer greece he said uh, he always tells me that the musician should do music you know and have other people that do the other thing so he, his mind doesn't get corrupted. So he should focus on art. And also then you have time and you don't have the stress and you can focus. What happens if you put your art in hands of others, then things become dangerous. You know what I mean? Because they, they are not understanding your art. They are understanding the market very well. They do an amazing job. But to what extent do you want your, your art to become market oriented? You know what I mean? For example, recently I made a movie in Gibraltar, which is this very small uh, Britain colony in the south of Spain. And there is an amazing rock band from there. And I contact them to, oh, maybe you, you, you can cooperate on the music. It was very interesting. And they don't own the music, the universal, you know? So, so they are musicians who want to cooperate in an independent project, but they can't. You know what I mean? So it's very, it's very difficult. And to me, the good thing is that I found and this is an advice if any, there is any artist listening. To me, the compromise that finally worked, because obviously I've been 12 years doing this and you have a great moments and tough moments where you are thinking that this makes sense when you have zero dollars in your account for many months and you're working your ass off, you, 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 you start to hesitate. And then I found the compromise because I, I didn't want to change my movies. And for example, with the Tibet documentary, you know, when I do a movie, people ask me how long it's going to be. And I say, I don't know. I edit, and I edit what I think is good. If it's 10 minutes, 10 minutes. If it's uh, two hours, two hours. I, and with the Tibet movie, I got a couple of distributors, big ones in Spain, telling me, man, this is so good. If you make it 90 minutes, we put it on the cinemas. Imagine, I was 24, having my, my documentary in the cinema. But yeah. it was not a 19-minute movie. It would be a boring one. Yeah. 50, 52, everything, all the time, things are happening. This is my style. 90 minutes would be my style. So I had to hesitate. And then I thought, okay, if I'm not a, if I if I'm not willing to change for the market, I have to find something else. So what I do now, I do kind of corporate movies or I do I do video journalist, video journalism, which is with the um, best TV in the in Germany. And with this, I pay my bills. And then with my documentaries and artistic work, I have, don't have any expectations. So if anybody comes to me saying, I, I give you this if you, I say, thank you, I don't need it, you know? It's always difficult to find the balance, isn't it? Hmm. Um, so, <laughs> in the Greek Rock uh, Revolution documentary, you asked the members of Night Stalker if it helps to be stoned when listening to their music. So, let me ask you the same question. When you're listening to the stoner rock, do you prefer to listen to it when you are stoned or do you prefer to listen to it when you are not stoned? At home, uh, I don't need anything, just my, my headphones. But I think uh, life, it uh, definitely enhances the, the experience. Nice. Definitely. And, I, and I think it's also part of the culture. I, I, I met my best friend. Uh, that's one of the reasons I moved in Berlin. Is because, uh, and I don't say this is uh, good or not, but uh, you can smoke in bars. And this is something I never like. But then when you can, uh, you know, 
enhance your experience to say it that way in a concert right right in front of your you know of your best artist and in german there is this culture of sharing a lot and you know for example one time you have and you share it and some other time you are there and you are oh, it's amazing it's so mo this moment is so amazing but i don't have anything to enhance this moment and then there is somebody next to you which offer it to you and you create you create a link you know because the the scene is not so big you will see this person yeah, again yeah. and again so so for me the, the the stoner culture is not just the the being a stone but is the you know the community the sharing the looking at each other uh, when when in a concert everybody is a stone in my opinion everybody is on the music you know and this is something i really like in a stoner concert that it's very rare to see people just chatting and not caring about the music you know people is there each each, each person with their own treat and then when the song finishes you know you look at each other and Everyone is coming from a different uh, planet, you know, and we we, we meet again uh, back yeah. on Earth <laughs> until we start uh, again with the next song. Fantastic! I like the way you say that. Um, and final question: So uh, the the documentary Greek Rock Revolution starts off talking about the financial situation of Greece and the financial crisis. Spain, where you live, was also, and probably still is, would I be correct to say that, still is in a not great financial situation. So have you noticed the same thing happening in Spain that you have, uh, that you noticed happening in Greece? And what is the uh, music culture like in Spain? There, there is a very, very, very strong difference with uh, Greece and with the Spain. The thing with Spain is that we were very bad until the 75 because we had the dictatorship. It was one of the latest dictatorships to finish in Europe. So we were really, really behind the other economies in Europe, especially uh, talking about the society. You know, uh, Swedish women started coming with uh, diving suits and we were amazed. Imagine only 35 years ago. Yeah. So Spain was coming from the bottom. And then in the 90s, uh, you know, in the 80s, we had the, our golden time of uh, punk, rock, because we're coming from dictatorship. The religion had a lot of power. The, the, our dictator set the, the steps for the democracy. So our democracy is coming, you know, the, the pillars of our democracy, they come from a dictator's hand. So, so these bands, they were fighting, they were encouraging, you know, for, okay, let's stop religion telling us what to do. Let's have a real democracy, uh, no more corruption. And it was amazing punk rock uh, scene, 80s and 90s. What happened then? Because there was a crisis, but before the crisis, it was a, Amazing. We call it the bubble in Spain because we have a big construction uh, bubble, which basically destroyed all of our seaside uh, and spoiled uh, places. So many people were making money, not thinking on the future. So, so we make a lot of money, and this uh, everybody was too comfortable. And then I believe this made uh, disappear the scene. So even even if uh, then there was a recession, we were already, you know, we're coming up, and. And in Spain, they started a, a policy of political correctness and uh, that I really don't like. When I, when I was um, 22, which is uh, 12 years ago, in Spain, they put this law that uh, basically, they call it the, the civic law, but they, they forbid to gather people in the street. And then everything changed because I, I grew up, uh, yes, I, I didn't go to a disco ever in my life, we just went to the street with a beer and we talk. And the amazing thing, amazing thing of this is that you were talking at the end of the night, you talk with a, with a rich guy that has way more money than you, with a humble guy, with the homeless, with women, with men, with a black guy, with a Chinese guy, with a, it was the most democratic way to go out in my opinion. And they forbid it. And I think that's where everything started. And unfortunately now, and I say unfortunately from, from my opinion, obviously, because music is very subjective. But uh, we are now in reggaeton land. And when I see the, what's happening with the lyrics, with the, especially, you know, we've come a long way to fight for women's rights. And I believe all this uh, music movement is, uh, is damaging so much, putting the woman as an object in the lyrics, in the visuals, in the, uh, it hurts me. It hurts me very much. And, and unfortunately, the, you go to a rock concert and there is nobody below 30 years old. Well. So this is really, uh, yes, short ago we were talking with the band. We're, you know, thinking, oh, maybe the, 
you know, the rock is in, a, in Spain is a, in danger of extinction, you know? Maybe in 40 years, nobody will go to rock concert because who knows? Thank you very much. Is there anything that we have not touched on, anything that you would like to say before we finish off? Mm, well, I, I missed to, to just mention two things that the, when we're talking about the Tibetan uh, documentary, because you were a musician, one of, for me, of the main most important things to, to achieve was to, to gather the best Tibetan music. So it took me many, many months to, to get all the musicians, which are mostly in, in exile, most of them. And uh, so to me, uh, if anybody's interested in Tibetan music, the documentary is a good thing of a uh, good compilation. And it was amazing because uh, at one part of the documentary, I was totally lost. I, I didn't find a way to put the things together, to know how to, to you know, to, to, to show the feelings I wanted. And there was a, the best musician, arguably the best Tibetan musician, was the one, the only one I could not reach. Yes. No way. And then I, I realized when I was in Indonesia, I met a girl from Ecuador. And uh, she, she was uh, kind of helping me with the Tibetan documentary because she was very close to the Tibetan culture. And then this girl started dating this musician. How amazing is that? <laughs> That's in brilliant. that very moment, in that very moment. And then she says, don't worry, this, this man is going to compose the music for you. Wow. So then I, I told, he said, I don't want to see any images. Tell me what feelings you want to put there. I gave him some keywords and he just made it. You know, and so then that, I put the music and the images were flowing alone. Wow. So that music was specifically composed for your uh, Tibetan documentary. Yeah, that uh, uh, three or four tracks from the movie. Yes. And with a specific uh, traditional Tibetan instruments. And then I felt how, you know, because I, I love many things from being, being an independent filmmaker. And that one thing I miss from not being a super, you know, director uh, famous is that to not have amazing musicians compose music for me, because this is something really incredible. The experience that you want to say something, sometimes I do it still with friends, but uh, it's, it's amazing. And, and I see, you know, just to close the, the gap, we started how 12 years ago, I had no idea about audio in the, you know, in my movies. And now I come to a point where I, I think it's so important, the music, the audio, the silence also, the silence is a form of audio. And I yeah, think music, it's beautiful. Music plays a big, big part in your uh, in your movies. I've noticed, and uh, yeah, your to have people composing music specifically for your films, I can imagine, would be an absolutely amazing experience. Really special, yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you very much for your time. It's been great speaking to you. And yeah, maybe someday, hopefully, we will get to meet and yeah, have a drink together or see a band playing together. For sure, that will happen. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. My, no worries. My Have a great day. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye.